King of Naples, being an enemy to me inveterate, hearkens my brother's suit, which was that he should presently extirpate me and mine out of the dukedom and confer fair Millen with all the honors on my brother, whereon a treacherous army levied. One midnight, fated to the purpose, did Antonio open the gates of Milan, and in the dead of darkness, the ministers for the purpose hurried thence, me and thy crying self. And Prospero needs to read at least, not as old, as, he's not Miranda's grandpa, but usually he's cast with like 60, 70 year olds. So I really love a Prospero who's in his 40s or 50s and, and does have some more life to live but is old enough to be Miranda's dad. Mark, who, who was cast as Tempest, had contacted me a couple, we've been working together for 35 years, so he'd contacted me a couple months earlier and said, hey, I'm available and really interested. And I said, great, come to auditions, because I don't know who else is coming and I don't know how this is gonna go. I don't like to precast at all because uh, many years ago I made that mistake and then what happens is you lock into one and then everybody else has to go with that one and if other people who show up don't really go with that one then you have to force it and so I really love to leave it wide open and uh, and then Mark came in and just really was was an excellent choice. We, we rehearsed for four weeks. Um, Actually that's a luxury for, for most theater yeah. in America. Um, uh, normally it's anywhere from two to three it's really, really short, mm -hmm. um, but we are rehearsing uh, uh, in, in a lot of cases sometimes all day long, and maybe we're rehearsing for six hours at a time, mm -hmm. six to eight hours at a time. The, the Shakespeare Festival is quite generous in that they work around people's work schedules, and so we'll, we met during the, the weekdays, we usually met in the evening from four to five hours, and then we would have long days on Saturday. Uh, the first week was completely devoted to table work, which is just sitting at the table, everybody sitting, reading the script through. We read it through once all the way, and then we start at the very beginning, and we just read passages at a time, uh, scenes at a time, sections of it, and then we talk about it, and we have big table discussions. So if this was a revenge tragedy, nobody dies in the end, right? Um, and in fact, everybody gets pretty much what they want. It's all kind of a happy ending. So revenge doesn't seem to be the, the theme of the play, the purpose of the play. And um, I think that it's more about forgiveness and that there is freedom in forgiveness. He's probably, at least in my own personal experience of, of, of times when, when I feel like someone has betrayed me and I have to still deal with them in sort of way, I compartmentalize, mm -hmm. we all, because you know, we have to move on. <laughs> um, and if I, I may even say to myself that I forgive them, that doesn't mean I necessarily have. Mm -hmm. um, there is, there is a, 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 a sacrifice in forgiveness. You have to give something up to forgive somebody. And that might be your pride, that may be any number of things, but there's an enormous amount of humility in, in not only giving forgiveness, but asking for it as well. And I think he does both of those things in the course of the play. In the course of the play, that, that Prospero not only learns that he has to forgive his brother, he has to forgive King Alonso in order for the play to move forward, in, more, in order for everything to be right, for him to be the, the person that he says he is and wants to be. But he also has to forgive Calvin. It was something that, that Kit Bullen, who was our kill, Caliban, did. He, he watched a lot of, of uh, primates to sort of create his physical character. I could tell that he had, he had uh, uh, sort of based him on primates. And he's like always down on his knuckles and jumping around. And very, very physical performance. But something that he did very early on in that speech, the first act where he says, you loved me, he held his hand out, which I knew enough about the behavior of apes, that this is a, sen, uh, a sign of submission. Mm -hmm. I submit to you. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's interesting. So Prospero needs to reject that in the first act. And then I, no pun intended, ape it. I, I <laughs> mimic that in the second act mm -hmm. as a means so that this is a language he will understand. So I submit to you. Um, 
and uh, so that to me, uh, it's the first time I've ever seen that scene done in which the two embrace. I'm a Shakespeare nerd. I've, I've started reading Shakespeare when I was in sixth grade. I got a book, the, the Charles and Mary Lamb book, Tales from Shakespeare, and so I started, I was a big fan ever since then, and I've, I've, I've studied all over the world with some of the, uh, with some of the world's greatest teachers and actors, and I'm very grateful for that. Why, after 400 plus years, do we still produce Shakespeare? Um, it must be because he still speaks to us. He still has something to say about the human condition. Uh, Harold Bloom, who's uh, Professor Emeritus at, um, is it Harvard? I think it's Harvard, maybe Yale, but I think it's Harvard, um, wrote a book called uh, Shakespeare, The Invention of the Human. Mm -hmm. And he even, his, his hypothesis is that Shakespeare, we, we owe Shakespeare to who we are as modern people today because with, way before Freud, before Jung, before behavioral sciences, he understood how people thought. He understood how people think, how they love, how they hate, um, how they treat one another for good or for ill. And I think there is still a great deal for us to learn from him. He had an insight into the human condition that um, uh, nobody has really had before or since. Thank <laughs> you.